أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيد مولانا حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum to everyone, to all of you. Thank you so much for returning to the Nahja Balaga Book Club. Um, this is my favorite group, but you know, if you hear me say that to any other groups, I really mean it for you guys. This is my favorite group, and I'm really looking forward to the discussions we can have and the interactive um, you know, feedback that I hope that all of you have got. Those of you who were here uh, last week, we established that this book club has been set so we can focus our attention to the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen as found in Nahj al-Balagha. And there are so many themes and discussions that we could have, and we are eager and we are inclined towards a motivated attempt to just learn as much as we can over the next 10 weeks. Now it's nine weeks because we had last week. Um, and those of you who are here, I will assume you are signaling your intention that inshallah we're in this together. And that fills me with joy, alhamdulillah. The next step, is twofold there are two next steps one is to discuss the sermon which we set that we're going to discuss today which is sermon one of Nahj al we picked this because it is the most important the introduction it is the foundation of this book and it shows us how Ali ibn Abi Talib sees Allah and sees many concepts that are useful and valuable um, for understanding this religion and whatever we look at for the next nine weeks it all goes back to how Ali looks at Allah like this is an important relationship and from it comes all these other discussions so that's what we're going to look at today i hope some of you have had a chance to read um sermon one or you have a natural with you either it's the physical copy or if it's online on al-islam uh, feel free to to look at it inshallah and i will in today's session read along different sections and i'll ask you what do you think about this theme or what did you think when you read this word or this this topic and if you have any thoughts please you know do share this is a book club inshallah and um, i look forward to that but before we start, we have to vote. We have agreed that we're going to vote on one of the many themes of Nahj al which we want to devote ourselves to for the next, uh, for the rest of these sessions. Because I would like us to dive deeply into a topic or two that we think are is important collectively, and we believe in voting and and giving everyone a voice. Inshallah. So we will vote. Now, here's how the voting is going to work. I'm going to quickly go through what are the options for the different themes we can look at um, for Nahj al There are nine options. Inshallah, after I finish, um, Muhammad's going to put a link in the description to a Google form. As soon as he puts it, please vote now so that we know in the session what it is that we're going to be looking at over the next nine weeks. Based on what you guys vote for, I will have an understanding of where to take this book club with this group. Now, if there's overwhelmingly like one thing that everyone votes for, I don't know what that thing is, by the way, then that's what we're going to focus on. But if there's one or two or maybe even three, which are very close and tight and they're very and they are linked together, then I can think about a a study plan which incorporates sermons, letters and sayings related to that theme and that topic and look at readings for that. But it really depends on what you think and what comes out from this. So there are nine options. Let me go through them one more time so you know what they are and you can make an informed decision, inshallah. Last week, by the way, I said, if anyone wants to influence anyone, you can. And, and, and some people wrote in their messages what their preference was, but now is the time for voting. Option one to vote for how we take this Nahj Balagha book club forward is on Tawheed and Aqaid. So if you enjoyed reading Sermon 1 and you liked the way that Imam Ali speaks about Allah Azza and his qualities, um, how he thanks him and how he mentions him in his du'as, and you want to know more about the proofs of God, how Allah is in the eyes of Amir al-Mu'mineen, this is the option for you, right? So that's the first option, Tawheed and Aqaid. One of the sisters mentioned a really great point last week, which is what's the difference between Tawheed and Aqaid? Tawheed, of course, is the belief in one God. Aqaid is our theology. And this one, if we choose this one, is all about belief in Allah, his justice, how he acts, his Tawheed, but other things relating to his being. Okay, option two is Irfan. So if you vote for option two, you are considered specifically in those spiritual and mystical aspects of Tawheed. It's a very certain type of discussion which we could have if people want to have it. And there is good literature on it to look at how Imam Ali Islam describes the path of gradually detaching from this world and, and going through the process of fana, of uh, self-annihilation in the eyes and the face of Allah. Now, there are many concepts and themes which could come up here, including the unity of existence, wahdatul wujud, and these other mystical ideas, which we will only touch upon, but we will give a good summary of this topic 
if there is feelings. Option two, Irfan. Option three is government and justice. So if you are interested in this topic and you want to know how Imam Ali Islam describes justice and adl and government and how we should form political opinions today, you will pick option three. Option four is on morality and religious advice. So here, the Imam helps us to know what is right and wrong in different situations. We'll go through sermons and speeches where the Imam speaks about how to know, to, how to know what haq looks like in different circumstances and how we can make our own, our own selves solid decision-making uh, instruments so we know what is right and wrong in new situations. You would choose this one, by the way, if you're interested in your own self-development as a priority. Option five is dunya. So it is how does Imam Ali al-Islam describe this world, this dunya, um, in a way that is both reprehensible and useful if a person knows the secrets of using this dunya. But of course, Nahj Ablaga is written, is compiled about sermons and speeches at a very delicate time in the Imam's life where he's very unhappy and dissatisfied with those around him. And so we see in his description of this world, which we might relate to. Option six is women's rights. So in this point we mentioned, there are many themes and discussions in Nahj Ablaga related to women specifically. And when it comes to discussions like giving rights to women today, male-female interactions, feminism, many of these themes go back to, if you want to look at use religion, how Imam Ali al-Islam looks at these issues. So you might select that one if you're interested in this topic. Option seven is Imamat and Khalafa. Here we're looking at issues like how the Imam treated the Khulafa of his time, how did he react to his haq being taken away from him, and how can we use these discussions to help us today in how we deal with polemics and, th and uh, issues to do with Aqidah, with Sunni Shi'i dialogue. She is she a dialogue dealing with Shia genocide, like those things would come up then. Option eight is prophethood. So we want to understand who is the holy prophet Rasulullah in the eyes of Imam Ali. You would pick option eight if you want to look at the prophet from the eyes of someone who knew him intimately. And then going forward, you can build your own relationship with the holy prophet, who is, of course, the central figure in our religion, by using Nahj Balagha to help you. And option nine is, of, is, is Quran. This option is if you want to know how to understand Qur'an in the way that the Imam speaks about Qur'an and how to build a relationship to this book, this book being the Qur'an, which uses Ahlul Bayt to help your understanding of the book, especially in parts which are ambiguous or difficult to understand. These are the nine options. Okay, before we vote, has anyone got any questions about them? Anything they want to ask? You can feel free to unmute yourself or put in the chat um, any reflections that anyone wants to share. There they are in the chat now. Um, thank you, uh, Ali, Ali Farshuri. And Muhammad, can you please put the link now so we can all vote, inshallah. And if you click this link on Google Forms, please do it now so that we can like, find, I'm really eager to know what the results are. So click it and let's vote, inshallah. Can I just, can I just say that um, with the form, please try not to vote more than once because I think you can. And some people do it accidentally. So just try and um, submit the form once and then, and then leave the form. And Abbas, how long should I give it until I check? Uh, I guess after you voted, can you just say that you've you voted? Like say done right in the chat, just so we know that people have done it. Mm. Thank you, Rabia, to get us started. And just so everyone else can copy, inshallah, just so we know that you voted. Um, Muhammad, can you see how many votes there are at the moment? Thanks, guys. Let me let me check. Let me check. I'm a little bit nervous to what you choose. <laughs> well, not nervous, but I'm I'm curious. I'm curious to know in what direction you'd like to take this. Yeah. So we've got 15 responses. Okay. So um, there's 26 people on the call. 16 responses. So I'll just wait till we get to the end. Yeah. So we'll wait. hopefully there's 25 votes. I will not vote unless like there's a deciding vote that has to be done. Um, technically, I voted for all of them because I made the options, but I'll allow there to be like at least 25 at most 25 votes and then we'll cap it there um inshallah thank you ali thank you said hashim ali and fatima zahra zainab thank you guys for voting thanks shazia i feel like i really want to know what you guys I, and i can't see who's voting for what so those of you who i know personally i want i'm interested to know what um you are interested in what number are we on muhammad 20. 20. Uh, last few people, maybe you're choosing, you're not sure. You're still deciding. I 
Fidak, you, you just mentioned what you voted. You're trying to sway the group. <laughs> you voted government and justice. Okay. Um, shall we give it maybe a couple of seconds more if anyone is still thinking about it? We're 121, so there's a few people still yet to vote. A couple people in this group have not voted yet. If you've not voted because you're not sure, that's fine. If you've not voted because you can't vote, please find it in yourself to vote. Oh, wait, oh, right, I'm just gonna I'm gonna post the link one more time just in case anyone has just joined or something. Okay. So there it is. Um, it's like X Factor. Oh, how are we going to see the results? <laughs> I can't see them. I've got them on my phone. Okay. Mm, what I can do is I can actually get it on my laptop and share my screen. And then we can all have like one big dramatic reveal. That is very exciting. Okay. Okay, one second, give me a sec. Let me make it so that you can share screen. Those of you who've still not voted, please do. Please oh, wait, do wait, wait, wait. If I, if I, don't make me host, otherwise your recording will stop. I'll make it that you can share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how are we doing for the votes? How's it looking? 22. 22. Come on, guys. Last couple of you, inshallah. Um, last three. Please vote. I would hate to have it that close. That's close by like one or two and someone didn't vote. Um. This is quite interesting. There are certain things that I thought actually no, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm not. I'm not. Um, how do I make it that you can, uh, Muhammad, that you can uh, share your screen? I don't know. Okay. No worries. I can just reveal them. Okay. So I've got to add. Um, to... <sighs> All right, guys. If you've not yet voted, please vote in the next 10 seconds. Like, just click it if you're looking at it. And if not, then we're going to proceed without you. How many votes are there all together, Muhammad? So there's 22 on the form, and then someone's just messaged me. So that's 23. And you can vote for them. Yeah, yeah. Just put it down for them. All right. We'll reveal the results, please. Tell us. Okay. In a dramatic fashion, you know? <clears throat> okay. So. Wait, let's do this properly. Let's get them out properly. The the listen. I'm not going to put on a fake voice and make this for dramatics. Basically, yeah. the most amount of vote, votes was morality and decision making. Nice. Okay. How many votes? So, and then that was six votes. And then Tawheed and Aqaid got five. Government and justice got four. The Quran got four. The dunya got one. And then everything else got one. Okay, interesting guys. Uh, so, morality, government, just and Tawheed got the most. Like those three were the top three, well, and the rest got well, one. Well, yeah, well, well, um, yeah. Tawheed and Aqaid got five. Government and justice got four. Joint, joint with the Quran, which also got four. Okay. So yeah, six, five, and then and four. Guys, so that's you, yeah, that's yeah, that's morality and decision making. That's uh, that's one. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, interesting. Okay, here's what we'll do. Very interesting. So you really didn't make it easy. I thought that you'd like you'd all go for one or two, and then we can choose between them. But fine, you, you all kind of were split a little bit. Uh, Muhammad, send me the results, inshallah, and I will I will I will try and find a way to combine that at least the top three because they, they there is a way of combining um, moral uh, morality, government justice, and tawhid, and then we can use Quran in certain places. I think instead of focusing on Quran separately, because that will take the discussion in, in a different way. But definitely these things go together. Definitely. Okay. Send me the results later. Well done, guys, for voting. So I guess going forward, we're going to focus on Nahj Balagha and, and um, internal decision making. So making the individual a good decision maker. And one of the examples we'll look at in how to make decisions is politics. And we'll always draw in our source for where we get our knowledge from to make these decisions. And that will be Tawheed. And we'll find a way, inshallah, to introduce concepts of philosophy to help us in making decisions of politics and faith. I think that seemed like a good way of doing it. Um, what I will do is thank you for voting, everyone. Thank you so much. 
Um, if you didn't get to vote and you, you wanted to and it would have been close, unlucky. Um, we will, I will go away after this session, make a reading plan. And on the WhatsApp group, if all of you are part of it, I will then put on what is the sermon or the saying for the following week tomorrow, inshallah. I'll put it on there tomorrow. Um, but let me do a bit of research to get things right. Well done, everyone. Okay, good. Uh, let's get started today, inshallah. Um, I hope no one is too, you know, dejected about that. I hope we're looking, we're looking positive about the course. But let's start with Sermon 1. So if you have got Sermon 1 with you, or uh, you have an online copy or the app, or you have the hard copy book, please keep it with you, inshallah, and let's go through it. Now, in Sermon 1 of Nahj al Balagha, um, Khutbah 1, Imam Ali al-Islam discusses who is Allah. He discusses how to thank him. He discusses how to know him. He discusses how to speak about him in what language to use when referring to him. And he gives many examples of what Allah has created as proof of his magnificence. So the example of the world and how it was made. The example of angels and how they were created and what their function is. The creation of man, of humanity, of Adam and Hawa. Um, how they were made and why they were made. And then the khutbah goes to a number of matters of fiqh, such as why are there prophets? Why do we do hajj? What is the purpose of this religion of Islam? And that sequence follows because he started by explaining who is Allah. Now, as all of you know, the core foundational belief in Islam is Tawheed, belief in one God. There is no other rival to this, to this belief. The importance of Ahlul Bayt, the function of Quran, the reasons why we are trying to be religious in a Western climate, all these things go back to having a relationship with God, a real, true, honest relationship where you know God. And we are trying to live a path where we gain this ma'rifah, inshallah, where we get to know him. What I will do is I will go through sections of the sermon from the beginning. I'd ask all of you to read Sermon 1 at least until the creation of man. I don't think we'll get there, but we'll work our way towards there to unpack some of the concepts, um, inshallah. And we will see what we find out about Allah from the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I will pause at different points to give us opportunity to ask questions, but I will ask you guys questions. So please, when I do, feel free to unmute your mic, um, to either raise your hand if you feel comfortable or to use the chat. But I really do want to hear from you about this sermon. Let's begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahilladhi la yablughu midhatul qailun. There's possibly no more of a phenomenal opening to a sermon than this. All praise be to Allah, whose worth cannot be described by speakers. Whose bounties cannot be counted by those who count, by those who are calculators. And, those who, and he whose claim to obedience cannot be satisfied by those who attempt to do so. Meaning, those people who would even try to describe him will fail. The height of intellectual courage cannot appreciate him. And the, di the divine understanding cannot reach him. No eulogy exists, there is no speech for him, no time is ordained, and no duration is fixed. And so he created and brought forth creation from his power, from his qudra. And he brought, he dispersed the winds from his compassion. And he made firm the shaking earth with rocks. Let's pause right there. Have you heard Allah described in this way by anyone else truly? Even the beginning, Alhamdulillah, all praise be to him who cannot be described by those who can speak. Just قال, قال, anyone who can talk, they will fail in describing him. In fact, there are three groups mentioned in the beginning who if they try in their respective method will not succeed. You have قائلون, those who talk. They can't finish the praise of Allah. Then you have Aradun, those who count. They cannot count numerically the number of blessings of Allah. And then you have Mujtahidun, those who strive, those who try. In case you thought that the issue is us, that 
we are not trying hard enough. No, even those, everyone who is able to try in this one task of describing Allah's majesty will not, if they all come together, finish in counting. They will not reach the haqq of Allah just by counting. These three words all demonstrate a different method of knowing Allah. Speaking, counting, and describing. Describing and speaking are different here. None of them are sufficient. Why? Because Allah is free from any description. We say hamd for Allah because we say hamd to that being who we are thanking them for their nature, for how they are. Not necessarily what they have done for us, but what they are undeniably. Madh, which is when you praise something, is often when something has done something for you or has volunteered, voluntarily done an action. Similarly, shukr is when someone has done a favor for you. But hamd is much deeper and more universal. Hamd is when that being that you are thanking for us, it's Allah, did not do something for me personally when I'm thanking him. And do not do something which was a favor to me. I'm thanking for his very nature, which is, of course, uh, a great way to thank him. And I can't count. The ni'mah he has done for me, the blessings he has done for me, which one day I will be answerable for how I treated his ni'mah, whether I thought of them as blessings or tests, I can't count them. This theme keeps coming up in our faith. Imam Ali is not the first one to say that we cannot count his blessings. He's not the last. But he says it in a very succinct and beautiful way. For example, with Nabi Musa, Allah says to him, Musa, praise me as I deserve to be praised. So Musa says, Ya Allah, how can I praise you when, when I mention one, I can remember another favor that you have done for me. So in saying that, in saying that phrase, Allah says, this is how I wanted to be thanked. This is how I wanted it. Similarly, we have a narration from our sixth imam, which the imam says, you will never be able to do justice to the hamd of Allah. And so someone said to him, what do you mean? He says, every time you thank Allah, you will remember that I need to thank him for being able to thank him in the first place. And then you'll create a new thank that you should do. And then you'll do the next thing. And then you'll create a new one after that. Each time that you add on one thank of Allah, you must acknowledge the ability to thank him. And you're trapped. So numerically, a'adu in here means those people who cannot even count and finish counting the blessings of Allah. So there's no, there's the height of intellectual courage cannot appreciate him. It's not just about description. It is our aql. It's limited. Now, some people are very, they think so much that we need to prove Allah through rationality, through philosophy. We need to find these arguments that are so logically sound proof for God that everyone will accept them. And I think they have a function. There is important to prove God through, through rationality. But we will not know the extent of Allah through rationality. We just won't. There is no possibility that our minds are sufficient in the task. This is one thing which the philosopher Ghazali in the Sunni tradition not commented on. He famously boycotted philosophy and then he came back to it. He argued, and many his Shia have argued, that philosophy and rational science is not enough. Our lives to be known through the heart, through love, not just through the mind. And Imam is saying the same thing. The height of intellectual courage will not be able to appreciate him. And there is no existing eulogy which can be used and copied that. Okay, I will say this thing and now you say it. And every time we say it, we are increasing in our thanks. It doesn't exist. There is no eulogy which exists, no description which we can use like a bio to copy and paste for Allah. You will not find anything which does the task. This is because every na'at, every eulogy, every description of Allah or of anyone is a limit. Because it can be limited. You can't speak forever and ever and ever. You have to have a limit. And everything which is limited has a had, a limit around it, which we'll look at in the next, in the next section. And if something has a had, a limit on it, it has a border to it, it implies that there is something which is inside it and something which is outside it. But how can we make a description of Allah in which we can include everything inside that one description? It's not possible. So the Imam says, well, not model. There is, it doesn't exist for you to copy. It's not there. And there's not enough time. So even if uh, you were going to try, there's not enough time that you would find in bringing together all of the descriptions in one place. You, you, won't, you won't be able to manage it. 
Also, by the way, Allah himself is free from time. By that we mean that Allah does not experience time the way that we do. Time, when we go from one fixed thing, point to another, we have to wait. But Allah is free from that wait because Allah is free from any change. He doesn't change. He doesn't move. Where, so where will he go? Where does he need to develop that he doesn't have already? We need time. We need space. We need things so that we can move from one place to another to get what quality we didn't have or to go to a place that we want to go. We need these things to get what we want. But Allah created time. Allah created space. So how can he be subject to these things? How can he be limited by these things? And so he created creation. He brought forth creation from his power. And now of all of the examples the Imam could have given, he says, And he dispersed the winds from his mercy. We see the example of winds being used a lot in our tradition to signify the greatness of Allah. One of my favorite lines in one of our du'a is مُسَخْرَ الْرِيَاحِ I think it's Dua Iftitah. Wadayanuddin, the one who, all praise be to Allah, who distributes the winds and establishes the religion. There's something about, you know, when you feel the force of wind on you and you feel the intensity on, on your face, on your body, and you know how your body shudders sometimes at that experience. There is something about being reminded of the glory of Allah in that moment, which keeps coming up in our traditions. Even in, in, um, in the Quran, we have verses about wind being a sign of power. And he made firm the shaking earth with rocks. So this ard that we have, the stability that we have, we have found, he made it firm. He made it fixed. And he's eternal. No time affects him. So this task he does is free from time. Sometimes we say Allah is eternal by using different words. Here the imam in discussing the eternality of Allah mentions there's no time which affects him. In Quran, sometimes we say Allah has sarmadi, he's eternal. Qulhu ahad, Allahu samad. Other times we use the word khalid or khulud, that Allah is that being who does not, uh, time is infinite for him, it's eternal for him. Sometimes we use words like dahr for time, sometimes we use words like asr for time, sometimes waqt like it's here. All these words are different, but they signify one thing. Allah has no beginning and no end. And so how can my praise for him have a beginning or an end? All right, let's pause for a quick second. I've mentioned a lot of points right now about Allah being described by the Imam. Let me ask all of you, when you look at this section, when you read it, was there a particular line which stood out for you? Was there a saying which stood out for you? And what is your impression of this opening statement from the Imam about Allah? If you have some thoughts, please do share, inshallah, at this point about the opening of the first sermon. If you do, inshallah, you can raise your hands in the chat or you can, uh, if you want to speak, or you can use the chat. But what did you find interesting in these first few lines? Did anything stand out to any of you when reading? I um I had to keep rereading, um, because I just really needed to try to comprehend certain lines, um, and sometimes sometimes that's just me not paying attention. But here I had to actively many times uh, reread, um, so that I could really soak up what was being said. Did I make it easier or harder in my description? <laughs> Did I explain some of the concepts? Yeah, 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 definitely. It was just more getting my head around them. Like I could, the English was fine. The, uh, on, on on a language basis, it was fine. But what was really being said, the meaning behind those words, took me a while to to take in. Definitely requires repeat. Um, listening to it multiple times. Thank you for sharing that point. Um, yeah, you know, to simplify, the Imam is speaking about three groups who can't know Allah, if they go through their method of knowing. People who speak, people who count, and people who describe. He then goes through why there's a limit to Allah. It's because there is no way of encapsulating everything in one description. Like, it just can't be done. It's, it's literally impossible. We don't even have the faculty for it. And then he describes just a few things that Allah has done. Um, Brother Pedrock, I saw that your, uh, your mic was unmuted. Did you want to add anything to that? 
Assalamu alaikum. Um, no, sorry, it was uh, it was on by accident. Thank you. No problem, Aga. That's fine. Uh, there's a comment from the sister in the group, from Sister Kauthar. The fact that even those who try to understand or appreciate the extent of his greatness fail to do so. It's not that we are incompetent, but that Allah is too great to be fully understood. Exactly. That is, thank you, Kauthar. You've got the point. It's that even if we were the best at our respective approach, if someone was the best counter or someone was the best rational mind, it's, it's not on them. It's on the inability to know Allah fully. That is, that is the hard thing. You're exactly right. Um, you're exactly right. But the Imam continues, like he's still trying. It's not the case that because it's impossible, he won't try at all. He will try to explain Allah more for us. Uh, I will continue, inshallah, with the sermon just so we can continue about uh, how the Imam describes Allah. The first thing in religion, or the foremost, the one who is the first in religion, is the one who knows him, or who recognizes him, who gains acknowledgement of him. And the perfection of knowing him, like the way to know him, is to testify, just to admit that you know him or to testify of him. And the perfection of, of uh, testifying for him is to recognize that there is one, that he is one, his oneness. And to recognize his ones, the perfection of, of, his, of, his, of recognizing that he is one, is il ikhlas is to recognize his purity. Wa kamal al ikhlas lahu nafya sifatihi anhu, and the perfection of recognizing his purity is to deny him from any attributes. This is really important, and we'll come to that later. Li shahadati kull sifat anhu ghairu mausuf, wa shahadati kull mausuf anhu ghairu sifa. The reason why we need to deny him from his attributes. And we keep hearing there's 99 names of God. Mention the words of God, the names of Allah. Here's why it's a problem. Because Imam says every attribute of him, every time you say a name of God or an attribute of him, then that is different to that which you are describing. The name is different to him. And everything that every name that there is, which is being described, is different from the description. Now, let me explain this a little bit more, just so we know. If you describe me with a certain name, okay, a description, man, um, young, one person, whatever, that might apply to me, but I am not those names you give to me. Similarly, if someone thinks something about you, they have a name that they give you, a nickname or a quality that they think you are, you might well disagree with them. And the reason is because you are not what they call you. But even if it's true, you are not even the complete version of that word. Like, let's say you're smart. Let's say you get good grades. Inshallah, you get good grades, all of you. And someone says this person is intelligent. Okay, maybe you have some intelligence. But are you intelligence? No, you are not the quality. You maybe have some of it, or it helps to understand for someone to know you. That's not what you are. What you are is, is you, right? If someone has a bad quality, which they mention a few, which might be true. Right? Maybe someone says this person, you know, um, they're not always honest. Fine, it can happen where we find it hard to say the truth sometimes. It doesn't mean that I am dishonesty. It's a word which can be used to describe me, but I am not that thing. When it comes to Allah, we mention all of these names about him to try and describe him. Well, however, to actually know him, is to deny him from these attributes because he is not the qualities we are mentioning. In our tawheed, in our belief in Allah, we have Allah's essence and his attributes, his that and his sifa. Allah's essence is his actual reality, that being which exists. It is the ultimate Allah, Allah with a capital A, that he, he is. That Allah has done many actions, fi'l, which affect us. Maybe he created us, he was kind to us, he gave mercy to us, whatever. And it is in those actions that we learn a little bit about him. So for example, when he created you, you learn, oh, okay, he's a creator. So he is khaliq, get it. When he made this earth, this world, we realize he has power. Okay, he has qudra, he's qadir. I get it, now I know that he has power. Um, when he was kind to you, when, you need, when he needed him, and he gave you a mercy. Okay, he has a rahmah, I get it. 
But all these qualities are words that we use to try to know him. They are not his actual that, his essence. They're just words to help our minds understand him. And for Imam Ali السلام, the extent of, of acknowledging ikhlas to acknowledge the purity of God, the most pure you can be, is to know him in such a way you don't use these words to identify him anymore. You might use them to explain concepts and actions, but not his essence. His essence is far away from these words. This concept is not easy to understand, but it is the beginning to knowing Allah. Because if we're discussing, like let's say all of us want religion, okay? I want ma'rifah. Okay, I'm saying if you really want ma'rifah of this deen, if like if you want it, you need you need to uh, acknowledge Allah. Like you have to do that. Fine, I acknowledge God. God, you exist. La ilaha illallah. Like I admit it. Fine. But come out of If I'm going to acknowledge it, I need to recognize his tawheed. Like I need to know there's one God. And I mean that in such a way that I know one is a unique and distinct concept. I need to believe it in my soul. You know, my bones should bear witness to the oneness of God. It's not just something that's on my tongue. And if I want that, Mama is saying, if you want that feeling where your whole body is a sign of Allah, kamal tawheed, al ikhlas you've got to be pure and you've got to know him purely. You can't mix ideas with him. And of all of the ways the Imam wants you to know your Lord that are important to him, al ikhlas sifati anhu. You need to take away these ideas that he has qualities, that he has attributes. Because every time you make an attribute of him, you are pointing to him. But here's the thing. He is not the finger that points. He is the thing being pointed to. And that's why in one of our dua, I think it's dua Arafah, the Imam says, um, the one who points at you misses you. Actually, it's Imam Sadiq in a different dua. The one who points towards you misses you. They, they never find you because they're pointing to you. We want to feel Allah. We don't want to find anything to take us to him. We want him directly. And that ikhlas, that purity comes from understanding his essence is far away from our descriptions. I don't want to get too, too technical. But are there any questions about this point? Is there anyone who doesn't, doesn't make sense to you that I can explain more? Or is anyone who would like to give their explanation? The question from Sister Kawthar. What about Rahman and Rahim? Isn't Allah the greatest example that we have of these things? And so surely Allah is all Rahman. This is a beautiful point. Mainly because uh, Sister Kofa, those both those qualities come from the same reality of Rahm, right? Mercy. Allah is Rahman in that he is merciful to all beings and he's Rahim in that he's merciful to those beings who uh, acknowledge him, right? Rahman and Rahim, they apply differently. Question, where is Allah's Rahmah? Like, where does that exist? Where is the mercy of God? We say it all the time, but where is it? Is it in him that we're going to pull it and look, this is the mercy of God? And if we say it's in one thing and not another, isn't the mercy of God in all things, in universal? The truth is the idea of rahmah exists in the mind. It doesn't exist in Allah himself. It's how our mind has tried to describe him. Just like we use words like he is just and he is kind and he's powerful, these all exist as abstractions of the mind. They don't exist in his reality. And we in the Nahshu Bulaga Book Club want to understand how Ali looks at Allah's actual essence, his that. And for Imam Ali, السلام, he wants to get there without going through qualities. They might help us, but they are not him. Do you see, Sister Kawthar, that? Mercy is a description of Allah, but it's not actually Allah Himself. Or, or would you like me to? Or are there any thoughts that you'd like to add to that? This point, by the way, about denying Allah's attributes, it might seem controversial, but it is actually a very consistently held belief amongst our scholars and our ulama. The argument they put forward is that Allah's essence is different to his actions. We know that for sure. And we want to get to the good stuff, the actual essence. So when we say, la ilaha illallah, for example, there's no deity worthy of worship, we want to talk about that actual Allah. Allama uh, the great scholar, says that when you say la ilaha illallah, when you say this line, you know, you're not really saying there's no God but Allah. You're saying, firstly, ilah means deity. It's something which you worship. It's not just God. What you're actually saying is 
there is no deity which could be imagined which is worthy of worship except Allah. There's nothing that I could imagine to be Allah and follow that instead of him. Meaning, la ilaha illallah means I don't even believe in my idea of God. It's not about my imagination. It's not about the image of Allah. It's about the real Allah which exists. And I need to go from going from my imagination to the reality. Right? Um, it's got to be written. So it's about how our minds are able to understand Allah. But in reality, he is much, much more. Exactly. Exactly. Imam Ali is describing that your minds can't contain Allah. They just don't have it in, the, in its capacity. So what we're really talking about is going away from the mind to the actual being, to experience him. And we experience him from the mind and from the heart, which is why the Imam says, when they ask him, do you worship a God that, that you can't see? He goes, of course not. How could I worship a Lord that I don't see? I see him from the eyes of the heart. So it's more than one thing which knows Allah. But it's definitely not just the mind. Um, Allah is a is the definition of these attributes, but these attributes are not the definition of Allah. Yeah, that's the point that Imam Ali Islam makes just right there. Exactly. That these uh, attributes which we used are used to define him. But they don't succeed in finishing his definition. Even 99 names, if known completely, don't finish the job. Allah's definition is actually beyond these attributes, if I could add to what you've written. It's, it's beyond them. The attributes are just signs to help us know him. And Imam is saying at some point, when you're ready in your own spiritual journey, in knowing Allah, you have to shed away these names in believing they are Allah. You have to feel him. You have to experience him. As a comment by Pajwak, is that correct that Allah is the ultimate definition of all these attributes? He's beyond the ultimate definition of these attributes. That's the point which Imam Ali makes when he says, um, that there is no description which can exist for him. So like even if we were all to study the 99 names of God or however many names of God there are in Dua Joshan, like they mentioned, was it 1,000 or 10,000? I don't even know. But if we were to list them all together and know all of them in their complete way, we still wouldn't get close. That's the point of acknowledging that I'm not going to finish it and it can't be finished. Um, I hope that makes sense. So the attributes of Allah are mental. They don't exist in him. Now, if you want to know why they don't exist in him, we can continue in reading Nahjul Balagha. For the Imam says, فَمَنْ وَصْفَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ فَقَدْ قَرَنَهُ Whoever tries to say that Allah is his attributes, whoever like, tries to attach attributes to him, they recognize that there is something like him. So, for example, in our discussion, if we say that Allah is just, Allah is merciful, like I have an idea of justice in my mind already. Maybe I know a just person. I have grown up seeing justice around me. I've tried to know him through something that I have understood. Similarly, maybe the greatest mercy that I have felt personally is the mercy of my mother. In our hadith, we say that the mercy of a mother to a child is, is the greater mercy you can feel. But Allah's mercy is much greater. But the moment I try and equate that feeling to Allah, the Imam is saying you recognize something similar to him. And the moment you recognize something is similar to him, you've said there's two of him. You've said there's at least one other thing that's like him. And the moment you say there's another thing like him, you've made parts to him. Because you've said there's something that's like him that I can take out, understand it, and put back into him. You've made a juz. You made him almost like a collage with different pieces and pixels that I pull out, know and put back in. I can't view Allah as a collage. I can't view him as a symphony. I can't view him as a collection of things because there is no individual juz to him. It's all one essence. It's those parts which my mind uses because that's how we are. We like to break things down in our mind. But Allah's not like that in his reality. Waman jazahu, and the one who tries to um who the one who finds different parts to him like this. Jahilahu. They never knew him. They mistook him. You know, they had jahil for him. Waman jahilahu faqad ashar alayhi. And the one who mistook him tried to point to him. You know, we said you can't point to him. They tried to indicate the ashara of him. Waman ashar alayhi. And the one who tried to point to him, faqad haddahu. They made a limit for him because they pointed at something that is a part of him to know him. And the one who tried to make a limit for him, they tried to count him. 
they tried to number him. They admitted limitations for him, they numbered him. Because if you try to count Allah, you've said that he can be counted. If we think one is one as in one can be two, we've already said Allah can be counted. But if we say one, meaning one as in he's unique, he's beyond numbers, that's going to the next level. Woman qala fima. If you say, for example, in what is he? Fakad dhammanahu. You've said that he can be contained by something. Woman qala alama. So if you said, on what is he? Fakad akhla minhu. You've said that there is something that he can be on and not on something else. So even attaching prepositions to him that Allah is watching me or Allah is there or Allah can be found there. These are all ways in which we've tried to find space for him. Take care, Brother Pajwak, inshallah. Um, thank you for your thoughts, inshallah, and your dua. Please follow on YouTube for the conversation to follow next week, inshallah. But here's the problem. Every time we try and find some way of rationalizing him, like we fall short. And Imam Ali is trying to tell all of us in his own description that the moment you start attaching something to Allah, you've tried to know him the way that you want him to be known. I'll give you a really good example, which all of us do this. We've grown up, many of us have grown up in the West, right? Well, I have. I'm going to assume many of you guys have too. And the idea of God in the West often comes from the Christian notion of God the Father. So we view God as God the Father accidentally because we use the word God in Allah. What that means then is that certain ideas that we have in our mind about Allah, for example, don't do this deed, Allah will be angry with me. And let me do that deed, Allah will be happy with me, for example. Right. Who said that Allah has emotions like this? That sometimes he's happy with you and sometimes he's sad with you. Every emotion like that is a juz, is a part to him. And what I have done in saying this is I have made him someone who changes from one part to the next based on how he feels. That's a problem. Because now I can't know him. I just know what I want him to be. If I need him to be a father to me, I need him to be angry with me, I need him to be happy with me, I'll make him that. This feeling, this idea is called anthropomorphism. It's when you give Allah qualities of a human being or an animal. A human quality, anthro coming from human being. Why? Because I attach parts to him. But when I go back for a second and zoom out, and I realize it's not that I'm giving Allah parts. It's that the anger of Allah and the pleasure of Allah exists in his actions and in my actions. So if I do something good in that good deed, there's Allah's pleasure. And if I touch something haram, it's in that touch of mine that Allah's displeasure exists. But Allah doesn't change his happiness or sadness towards me. He's free from this change. He's free from juz. It's me who changes. Similarly, Allah is not pleased or displeased with you because he changes. It's because of what I did to him. For example, the example of many scholars that they give is if the sun is shining outside, you going outside and you going inside determines how much of the sun you experience. If you go out, you get the sun on your face. If you go in, you put a shade or barrier between you and the sun. The sun didn't change its heat or its light. You change the effect of the sun on you based on what your actions were. In, this, in a similar way, Allah doesn't change in being happy or sad with you or being having pleasure for you, or anger for you. It doesn't change. By doing a good deed, I allow myself to go and experience him fully. And by doing an evil deed, I make a barrier between me and him, which could be considered his displeasure and stop myself from experiencing him. But his default is love. That doesn't change. His love for his beings is his default position for us. He created us so that we may know him and that we may love him. So we have in Hadith Qudsi that the one who knows Allah falls in love with him. That's why we were made. It's in my actions which prohibit me from experiencing that love of God. And I think in reading this part of Nahj Balagha, and Ali, I'm going to come to your comment in a second. I think the Imam is trying to tell us that we shouldn't make our lives harder in knowing Allah by how our mind works and overthinking things and adding qualities and trying to know him rationally. A proof of God, like the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, design argument, might be helpful in proving God to others, but I, don't, I shouldn't need that for me. For me, I should experience him. 
we read in the Quran, Sanurihim ayat fil afaq or fi anfusihim. There are some signs of Allah which we see in the horizons, but there are some signs we see in ourselves. And I want that. And that's what the Imam is saying you should be looking for. You should be looking for a way of knowing Allah which is which is not taken away by these negative forms of knowing him, by making parts for him or juz for him. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sister Kothar. Ali, I'm coming to your comment. My apologies. One way I think about it is if everything which is good is from Allah, we can try to identify the different aspects of his goodness by looking at this from different angles. But this doesn't change that he is the only true perfection. Ahsan Ali. And like infinity, we cannot reach this perfection. However, in our eternal journey towards this goodness and perfection, we have the potential to come close, inshallah. You got it, Ali. You got it. He is the perfection. He is khair. He is kamal. The word we're using his word, kamal. He is perfection. Like That's not going to change. It's the angle which I come to him with, which changes how much I take from him. You, you are right. And in that eternal journey towards goodness, perfection, maybe we can come close. Now, it's in our fitrah, our nature, to touch that which is good. We have this in our traditions. And also, if you think about it, like uh, we like sweet things like naturally. And we, we don't want to touch fire when we know that it's harmful, like by our inclination, by our almost like it's tabi'i, like it's in our, our, um, our instinct, right? However, we all want to be close to that which is good. We all want to be close to that which makes us laugh, which gives us joy. It's in us. We're inbuilt to want goodness. And if Allah is the source of all goodness, we want him naturally. No one teaches you to want goodness. It's just a matter of knowing the name of that goodness and knowing the name of the one whom originates goodness. And that is Allah. Um, so that, that is a really beautiful point from you. The point, my explanation was okay, but it came from your point, Ali. So, so thank you so much. Um, thank you. Are there any questions that anyone wants to add here? Or any, if anyone wants to raise your hand or unmute, feel free, please feel free to. Yes, Sister Fatima, bismillah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Asalaam, Sister. Thank you so much for the session. It's been really interesting. At your I service. I have a question. Um, I'm a little bit confused. I'm finding it a little bit hard to wrap my head around it. But if by saying Allah is perfection, is that in itself not giving him an attribute? This is a really good point. Because what you, I think what you mean is we're using like a word to describe him and that's the whole problem, right? Yeah, and like if we're doing, if you can't assign perfection to him, then how can you ever hope to get close to that do you see what i'm trying to say it's very confusing i get exactly what you mean because i've i've had the same feeling in in studying this the way that we get perfection from is when we prove that allah exists in the first place like before all of this stuff we say allah is he's the he's the being which must exist and we come to that view because we say that as you as you may have heard every cause must have a cause to itself and we have to stop somewhere right there's got to be some place where we just stop and that contains the first cause and that we argue is Allah because it can't go on forever and ever and ever in the same way, uh, you know, um, a race can't go forever if everyone's waiting for someone behind them to give them permission to run because then they're going to keep asking, asking, asking and we're never going to get started and, and get running. We need some way to just start and that's Allah. But we have this belief which I think answers your question which is that you cannot give something that you don't have in yourself. This is a, a view that we have from philosophy. You can't give something unless you have it yourself, right? So I can't give you a quote from the book Natural Balagha unless I have the book which I can read it from. Like I need to have it in me to give it to you. By the way, by the way, side note, this is also good for well-being where um, like I can't give happiness to someone if it's not in myself. I need to find happiness in myself and be, be confident and then I can give it to someone else. But you need it in yourself first. The reason why we say Allah is perfect is because we say that he already contains within him everything that he gives. So if it is mercy and kindness and these things that we don't know what they really are, we just have names for them. Whatever they really are, like that true essence of Allah, it must already exist somewhere. It must be there somewhere. Because although I'm using imperfect words to describe him, like mercy is not the best word. It's the best I can do, but it's not the complete word. And just is not the best word. Like, these words aren't perfect, but there's still some perfection there. There's something there. And, and I, I need to know that it exists in one place. 
And that's how we argue that Allah is the being who has already within him everything that he gives. And that's how we say perfect. We just mean that he's unlimited. If anything, by the way, now that I think about it, Fatima, perfect means here that we can't know the extent of it. It means, it means absolute, it means infinity. Um, that might make us feel a bit better about this because we're using a word to know that we can't know anymore. For example, Allah, the word Allah, it literally means to bewilder. <laughs> That's the name we went with to know God. We didn't go with Rahman, Rahim. The word we used for Allah is the one who bewilders. So in the name we acknowledge, we can't know him. So similarly to answer your question, Fatima, I would answer that we use the word perfect to show that we can't know the, we can't ourselves know the absolute. Um, does that answer your question? And, and if it doesn't answer completely, what was the last bit of your question? Because that was a separate issue. Um, I think it does answer quite a lot, actually. So, oh, okay. correct me if I'm wrong, um, but you mean we use the term perfect to represent our inability to comprehend perfection. I, exactly. And I agree with you because of this part of natural blog where the imam uses perfect in the same way as what you're describing. Where but if we, each if thing is a different thing. Go ahead. Sorry, if we can't comprehend perfection and we can't comprehend Allah at all in any way, then how are we to strive towards him? I get the point. Do you mean that if he's so transcendent, how can I even know him on a personal level? Like he's so far from my understanding. Um, yeah, like in my human capabilities, how am I supposed to at all kind of understand? It's a good question. I think the Imam answers that in the next section of Natural Balaga because he describes that concept so let me give you what the imam would say as we continue and then after i'm done let me know if you think that that answers your question okay thank you so much alhamdulillah no problem uh ali's got a comment um that everything points to leading back to a singularity for example it's difficult to identify a process which is not caused by another so you mean causation there has to be an end point which is the source based on observation of our existence however we cannot comprehend how allah can exist in and of himself we have limitation we have limitless power that is just something we accept the first part i agree with fully ali the second part is true but um it com it's true but it doesn't follow the argument the argument is that everything must go back to one point and that point we find as allah it must be one one thing which exists in the first place and as i was saying before everything which comes from that first cause must already exist in that cause so if Allah gives existence, he must have it in himself. If he gives kindness, he gives love, he must have it in himself. Now, by the way, we're not arguing Allah is not these things. Allah is all of these things. He is kind, he is merciful, he is just. As in, He has these descriptions, but he is not those things completely. Like he's more than those things. These are just ways that we're trying to understand him for us. He's more. So it might be true that God was merciful and kind to you. It just means that that wasn't everything that he was. He was more than that for you. And I, by acknowledging he was more, that is having, um, by, acknowledge, by, doing bih, by acknowledging that, I know that he is one. And by acknowledging that he is one, I know that I don't know him completely. Um, so it's part of having humility. Anyway, let's continue. Because I think Sister Fatima's very well times point is, is argued as we continue. Ka'inun la an hadath. He is a being, but he did not come into being. He exists, but he didn't come from non-existence. Fatima, this is the point that I want you to think about. He is with everything, but not. Um, but he, he's with everything, but he's not in physical nearness to them. Like he's not physically close to all of them. However, and he is different to everything which exists. But without being physic without being separate to those things. So he's both with you, but he is not you. And he's far away from you, far away from your understanding, but he's not separate to you. I'll explain what that what I think that means later. La bi muzayla. Fa'ilun, he does actions. La bi al harakati wal elati. He does actions, but without movement or instrument. He just does them the way that he does them. Basiron, he sees. Idla mun mun idla mandoro elehi min khalqi. 
he sees even when there was nothing to be looked at from his creation. So he had it in him before there was anything to see. He had that quality. Mutawahid, he's one. إِذْ لَا سَكَنَا يَسْتَعْنِسُوا بِهِ وَلَا يَسْتَوْحِشُوا لِفَقْدِهِ He is one such that there's no one who may keep him company or who will miss him in his absence. The first point is the most interesting point, I think, for all of us, right? And I know we've only got a bit of time for Maghrib, so I'll mention this point really quickly. He exists, but he didn't come from non-existence. He's always existed. I think I get that. He, he, he's here, but he was not created. Okay, I, I get that too. Like, I was created, I have a cause. He has no cause. I get that too. He's with me, even though he's separate to me. So Allah is nahnu aqrabu min hablil warid. He's closer to you than your jugular vein. Even though his reality is separate to me. He's both imminent and transcendent. And وغيره, And he's different to me. He's his own being who's not me. But without, but he is still connected to me. It is this, these two things, which is the main, um, what people think is a contradiction, but what we find is a gift. Allah is both so close and intimate to me. And at the same time, his understanding is so far away from me. And the reason why he can be both at once, transcendent from my mind, I can't understand him, and close to me that when I cry, he hears me, is because of how we've been created. He made us لتعرفوا, so we may know him. So he gave in us the ability to feel him, his existence in our hearts and our minds. Like he gave us an instrument. He gave us an instrument to know him. And he didn't have to. He didn't give this instrument to inanimate objects like chairs and tables. And he didn't give it in the way that he gave it to angels, where they can know Allah, but they cannot have that desire, that shahwa, um, that can get in the way. He gave us a very unique gift, which is that we can be close to him whilst not being connected to him in his existence. Imam Hussain al-Islam in, um, in Dua Arafah discusses this topic. Um, yeah, there's a few sayings from Dua Arafah which are about this, that he is both with me and he's away from me. And I am both close to him, but I am not him. I think the answer to the question is, is, is in this topic for all of us. How can Allah be both so far away from my mind, from my understanding, and yet he still lets me know him and, lets me, and knows me so completely? How, can, how is this possible? And it's truly a mercy from Allah that he gives us this chance to know him. Fatima, I encourage you to think on this topic, inshallah, um, and everyone to think on it as well. Because maybe in this words from Ali alayhi salam, we can find the answer. Okay. Are there any final questions or remarks from anyone about this? I know it's a bit complex, but we contained many useful points from the first khutbah. Any questions or comments? Because we are limited, so Zahra says, um, beings, his transcendence, and because we are limited beings, his transcendence, and his nearness. Oh, I, you, sorry, I wasn't understanding. So you mean it's because we're limited? Is that what you mean? I hit send before um, I finished typing. Um, I was just going to say that um, he can be both transcendent and near because he can be everything. But the reason why we can't comprehend um, what he is is because of our limits. Good. That's a very beautiful answer. So, so that answer would be that if he is like the sun, it is me who places a limit on how close I get to the sun. It doesn't change the sun itself. Or another analogy is, for example, water. Our scholars say that how much you take from Allah is how much you bring to him in capacity. So some people go to Allah with the heart, which can only take a, little, a few drops of him, and they go back with that. Some work really hard on their heart to take more of him, and they bring a much larger container, and they take more from him. And others, they enlarge themselves so much that they can contain more from him because of what the work they've done to themselves. So I think the point you're making is he doesn't change in what he can give. We change in what we can take. Um, so yeah, that is that if that's what you're getting at, that's a very good, that's a very helpful answer, inshallah. That it's on us. It's on us. Exactly. Thank you, Sister Zahra. The point was yours. I just assisted you. You made the point. Uh, inshallah. Any other questions or comments on this? If you don't understand, you can say, I don't get it. And then we can think about it another time. Um, anyone want to add anything before we come to a close? I don't think we have time to go through the rest of Nahtul Balagh or the first sermon. But here's the summary. 
Okay, I'll mention three summaries. Summary one. Even if we try our best, we'll never know the complete extent of Allah. Okay. Summary two. We want to experience Allah rather than try to define how he is from our mind because our mind is limited. Like giving qualities, for example. And summary three is that he is both far from our understanding and close to us based on how much we allow ourselves to accept him by our prayer and our goodies and all that stuff. Uh, go through, I'm going to use your summary as well. There's no standard relationship between us and Allah. Everyone is responsible for their own relationship. Exactly. You're responsible for yourselves. And part of Allah's justice is on that day when we are raised up, we will be asked, did you use your freedom to make actions to know him more? Like, did you try? Did you gain knowledge of him? Did you I know, join book clubs and things? But did you like, did you make that effort in yourself to know him? And if the answer is yes, then you will know him more. Uh, Muhammad is commenting that I have learned to be comfortable with the fact that I'll never fully know Allah. Knowing he exists is as close as I'll come. Beautiful point. And Imam Ali Islam acknowledges the similar thing. He acknowledges that we can't know him. Even he can't know him. But it's by acknowledging that we can't know him that we are on the right path of getting to know him, of gaining more ma'rifah. Because the beginning is The beginning of religion is his knowledge Or is, gaining, is recognizing him And inshallah we pray that all of us Can try and recognize Allah in the right way Okay Some beautiful points there Thank you so much to everyone who, who was listening And also who contributed um, Inshallah this today was beneficial Next week We're going to look at an amalgamation Of different themes of Nahjul Balagha Based on your feedback So give me some time inshallah To do some reading and find out how these how to link together different topics that you're interested in. And inshallah, on this journey, I look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, make sure you're in the WhatsApp chat uh, to, to follow the discussions. But other than that, thank you so much. Take care. Ma'asalam. Inshallah. Um, thank you again, everyone. And 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 Khuda uh, Hafiz. Ma'asalam. Thank you so much, sister. Thank you, everyone. Asantum. Thank you. Ma'asalam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Habibi Anta. Habibi. Assalam. Ali on Bali on law. Ali on Bali on law. Ali on Bali on law.